Good morning and welcome online to Hope. My name is Stephen. I am one of the pastors here at Hope and we are privileged that you have joined with us and with this community online. We are one church gathered together in different places, different spaces, but all gathered because of the work of Jesus Christ in each of our lives, all gathered that we might be empowered by the Spirit to live as people of the kingdom of God each day in our communities, in our work, that our lives, the words that we speak, the actions that we do, everything would be a prayer that reflects God's work and the glory of God and His making all things new in this world. It is great that you have joined with us online. Today is a special Sunday and I am really happy today and excited for the message that we have today. It's not coming from me. It is coming from Bill Burford. He's going to share with us today and it is a message that fits so perfectly in this time as we keep hearing different reports and different things and things that cause us anxiety and stress in this world. He reminds us of God's peace in this message today. So I'm looking forward to uh, joining with you, to hearing uh, what Bill has, the message Bill has for us today that God has given to him. As we like to encourage you each time as you gather online in these times to think about ways to use these services. We've had a few individuals who've taken together and they've invited friends and neighbors, invited them into their homes, and they've sat down and watched these services. And you can do that here with us at 10 a.m. or on YouTube, the files are still there and so you can watch this video at a later time. So make use of this service as a tool and a resource as we continue to grow together. Because what it means to be a Christian is to be in community together and to grow and to share our spiritual lives together is part of what is essential to being a Christian. And so I encourage you, invite friends, neighbors, family together, watch the service together, and then ask questions and discuss. Maybe there's something that said you don't agree with. Feel free to text us and let us know. But uh, use this opportunity to discuss and let God speak to each one of us in there. Maybe take a moment to pray together, maybe share a meal together, whatever you decide. It's a great opportunity. And we create these services specifically for you to be able to do that in this time. If you're gathered by yourself, that's okay. We understand some of us, that's kind of the reality of life. Maybe take a moment after the service to sit down with a journal or a piece of paper and just kind of reflect and write and respond and use that as a way to sort of have that discussion together of what God may be saying to you and what it means for you to live. Well, let's enter into our worship service today and hear our call to worship and our reading of Scripture. Let me pray for us, and then we'll hear our call to worship. Father God, you are good, and your love endures forever. And it's because of your unrelenting, unstoppable love and grace for each one of us that we are here today. And we pray that in this service, your Spirit would refresh, renew, and restore each of us, that we might live as people of your kingdom, not just today during this service, but in everything that we say and we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 46. If you have your Bible with you, whether it's in print or on your phone, we encourage you to read along today in our scripture today from Psalm 46. Hear now the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
As we come before the Lord today in prayer as a community, there are many things continuing to weigh heavy upon us. As we pray together today, we specifically remember and pray for Fonda Allison. As many of you know, Fonda is the wife of a former pastor here at Hope, Dwayne Allison, and Fonda continues to battle uh, COVID like so many people and is really in a quite serious condition. We also pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for the people of Haiti. We pray for the many who suffer. We pray for our community and our schools as in the next few days, Galesburg schools will be back in session and those challenges that are there, of course. It is with great need and great dependence upon God that we enter into prayer this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your people with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, Father, God, we come together today as your people, people needing and depending upon you. We pray specifically for Fonda Allison, for her husband, Duane, in this very difficult and painful time. We pray, Lord, for your healing. We pray for your miracle that only you can do. Lord, have mercy. Lord, today we pray for the people of Afghanistan, for those who suffer, for those who grieve, those who mourn, whose lives are in danger, we pray not only for your people, those who are followers of you, but we pray for the whole nation. We pray even for our enemies. Lord, have mercy. We pray today for the people of Haiti and those who suffer the devastating effects of another earthquake. We pray for your protection to be upon those who, who are carrying supplies and resources. We pray for those who suffer in grief. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we pray for our school district and its leaders, its teachers, its staff, and its students as they begin another year of school this year in the midst of the uncertainties and the complexities and the frustrations, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Grant wisdom and peace. Lord, show your mercy to those in our schools. Lord, we pray for our community as a whole, for your restoration, for your health, for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done that all people might look and turn to you and declare you as Lord, that they might trust you in every area of their life. And Lord, we as your people declare our trust and our faith in you. In the midst of uncertainty and difficult times, in places of doubt and fear, Lord, we place our trust and our hope in you, knowing that you will lead us, even in the darkest and most fearful of places. You are with us, you lead us, and you guide us. And so today we seek to follow you. Lord, we are grateful for your mercy. We are grateful for your grace and the way that you continue to work. We thank you and we praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to all of you this morning. I'm glad all of you have tuned in to the uh, online service. I consider it a privilege to do what I'm doing here this morning. And I just appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you. Before I read a scripture, I'd like to share something that I run across. It's not related to my message in any way, but it just, I thought was good. It's the advice from an old farmer. Things I want to say, but shouldn't. Your fences need to be horse high, pig tight, and bull strong. Keep skunks and bankers at a distance. Life is simpler when you plow around the stump. A bumblebee is considerably faster than a John Deere tractor. Words that soak into your ears are whispered, not yelled. Meanness don't just happen overnight. Forgive your enemies. It messes up their heads. 
Do not corner something that you know is meaner than you. It don't take a very big person to carry a grudge. You cannot unsay a cruel word. Every path has a few puddles. When you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. The best sermons are lived, not preached. Most of the stuff people worry about ain't never going to happen anyway. Don't judge folks by their relatives. Remember that silence is sometimes the best answer. Live a good and honorable life. Then when you get older and think back, you'll enjoy it a second time. Don't interfere with something that ain't bothering you none. Timing has a lot to do with the outcome of a rain dance. If you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. Sometimes you get, sometimes you get got. The biggest troublemaker you'll probably ever have to deal with watches you from the mirror every morning. Always drink upstream from the herd. Good judgment comes from experience. And a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back in. If you get to thinking you're a person of some influence, try ordering someone else's dog around. Live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, and enjoy the ride. Don't pick a fight with an old man. If he's too old to fight, he'll just shoot you. The advice from an old farmer. Things I want to say, but shouldn't. This morning, I chose Psalm 46 to share with you. And Psalm 46 was a psalm that inspired Martin Luther to write the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, in the year 1529. And a survey was taken of 10,000 people. A poll was taken of 10,000 people. And the poll was conducted by columnist George Plagueis. And A Mighty Fortress was one of those top 10 hymns that those people, those 10,000 people, chose. Some of the others in that top 10 were, of course, Amazing Grace, How Great Thou Art, In the Garden, The Old Rugged Cross, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, Blessed Assurance, He Lives, Victory in Jesus, and Holy, Holy, Holy. But just think, A Mighty Fortress, written by Martin Luther, written well, almost 500 years ago, was inspired, he, the Psalm 46 inspired him to write that hymn. Let me read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations on, in the earth. He makes the war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. And I was reading that from the New King James Version of the Bible. If you look underneath that Psalm 46, a, a few notes before the verses actually start, it says, For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. Well, we know that uh, the Psalms, many of them were made to be sung. And this particular Psalm, according to those notes, it says for the director of music, this was a, a Psalm written to the choir director. And it said of the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were temple assistants. And then according to Alamoth, that word is derived from a word Alma, A-L-M-A-H. It's a Hebrew term meaning maiden or young woman. And if you look in the Old Testament in 1 Chronicles 15, it says that certain men were to play their lyres, which is a form of a harp, according to Alamoth. Well, in the New American Standard Bible, there's a marginal reference, and it says, harps of maiden-like tone. Quite likely, this song, or this psalm, was to be played on soprano-like instruments or on highly pitched instruments of music, or maybe even sung by high soprano voices. But I thought those notes were interesting uh, to share with you before we actually get into the verses. Written to the choir director, written by the sons of Korah, and probably on high-pitched instruments or sung by soprano-like voices. Verse 1 of this particular psalm states the theme, and we could render that as God is an immediate source of help or strength when we're in a tight squeeze, because it says he's our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. The term translated trouble in that verse, in most versions of the Bible, is from a Hebrew word meaning to be restricted, to tie up, to be narrow, cramped. And it kind of reminds me of an expression that we sometimes uh, use to describe the idea of being in a jam. And we use the phrase, between a rock and a hard place. And it means to be in a pinch or in a tight squeeze. And the psalmist here declares that God is immediately available. He's instantly present in any situation. And certainly at those times when we feel weak and we don't know what to do. And in the second and third verses, the psalmist introduces some of the most terrifying scenes in all of life. Notice what he says. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. You know, this fear of mountains or cities even suddenly falling into the sea because of some catastrophe haunts a lot of people today. And the picture is very familiar to those people who live in Southern California. That's a great land of mudslides, earthquakes, and tremors. And the psalmist is saying that even in the face of utter destruction, he expresses a quiet confidence in God's ability to save him. And we will not fear. That's what he says. We won't fear when things like this take place. And you know, when we experience trouble of any kind, and when we feel weak, and it seems that the earth beneath us is shifting, and it's rolling, and it's sliding, 
And when life seems insecure, have you ever been there? Can we confidently say, I will not fear? And if we go back to verse 1, God is our immediate helper, our unchangeable, ever-present source of strength. He's kind of like our bridge over troubled water. So remember, God is our very present help, our strength. And that's why we need not fear those things when they happen. And you'll notice when I read this at the very beginning, there were three times that I read the word Selah. And the first time comes after verse 3. Selah is a term which actually means it's a time, it's kind of an interlude. Some Bibles even use the word interlude instead of Selah. It's kind of a time when we pause and think about what we've just read before, and think about it before we go on to the next verse. Then in the next section of verses 4 through 7, notice in verse 4, it refers to a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. Well, I found out that uh, Jerusalem was one city that did not have a river flowing through it. Many of the surrounding cities had rivers flowing directly through them. And that allowed the people to go ahead with their, go on with their agriculture by providing water for them. And it also facilitated trade with other countries. Jerusalem had no river, but it had God who, like a river, sustained the people's lives. And as long as God lived among the people, the city was invincible. But when the people abandoned him, God no longer protected them. And Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian army. And as we read these verses, it said, God is in, their midst, in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, just as the, at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. And as we read those verses, it sounds like the city is under attack. Nations and kingdoms have risen up against her. Yet it says, she will not be moved. Why? Because God is within her or in the midst of her. What was it that gave Jerusalem her safety? The indwelling presence of God. And this kind of reminds me of the account that we read in Mark chapter 4. And you know the story where Jesus and his disciples were in the boat. And they were crossing the Sea of Galilee when a storm arose. The disciples feared for their lives. And they woke up Jesus and they questioned how he could sleep at a time like this. But he calmed the wind and the sea. He rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. And he says, why could they fear? God was in the boat there with them. The boat would never sink as long as God was in it. Yet they should not have been moved, for the Lord himself was in their midst. And this is a perfect illustration of that verse, for Psalm 46, verse 5, where it said, God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. Now look at that term moved. Literally, that term moved means to totter. We have a slang expression that we uh, use sometimes. 
it means to totter or shake, but a term we use sometimes, say, we're all shook up. And if I remember right back in the day, Elvis Presley had a song, I'm all shook up. But God is in me. If he's in us, then we really have no reason to get shook up or to be moved. If we're Christians, Christ is living in us. We have the Lord God within us right here in our midst. And with him present, there's no reason to totter or be moved. God isn't going to totter or shake, nor is his dwelling place. So the next time you're tempted to panic, remember, God is in your midst. And then Selah at the end of verse 7 there. A time to pause. Kind of reflect on what was read before. Before you go on to the next verse. Then in verses 8 through 11. It seems that the scene has changed in uh, this next uh, section. It seems to be that of a battlefield. And we're kind of invited in that, uh, these next few verses to view the reminders of war. It talks about broken bows and spears, burned out chariots, which were probably overturned and rusty and other destroyed implements of warfare. And I thought, I wonder if that's what it was like after World War II on the beaches of Normandy or in the cities of Berlin and Hiroshima and London or the islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. You can imagine what you'd probably see there. Rusty tanks and sunken boats covered with barnacles, concrete bunkers and so on. But then a kind of a hush prevails over the land. It's as though God has said that is enough. Then listen to what the psalmist says following that. In verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. Depending on what version you read that ver verse in, one version I read said, or one translation said, cease striving and know that I am God. Another version said, stand silent, know that I am God. And even another version said, be quiet and know that I am God. You know, war and destruction are inevitable. But so is God's final victory. At that time, all will stand quietly before the Lord Almighty. And how proper it is even for us today to honor Him and His power and His majesty. We need to take time each day to be still and to exalt God. So whichever way you read it, be still and know that I am God, it means to relax, do nothing, be quiet, stop striving, quit racing around, relax, but that's easier said than done. Or there's a common expression, don't sweat it. The point is that God is in full control. So let him handle your situation, whatever it might be. And as he does, we are to cause ourselves to relax. You know, we're guilty sometimes of living in strife and panic. And sometimes we have a fretful spirit. Did you realize that God has designed and he's reserved a spirit of rest? For each and every one of us? Hebrews 4.9 promises, it says this, There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people 
of God. Now that's not just referring to a day of rest during the week. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Listen to what the Living Bible says for that. Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11. So there is a full, complete rest still waiting for the people of God. Christ has already entered there. He is resting from His work, just as God did after the creation. Let us do our best to go into that place of rest too, being careful not to disobey God as the children of Israel did, thus failing to get in. Now, does this mean that I just slip everything into neutral and do nothing? Hardly. Our responsibility, my responsibility, all of our responsibility is to deliberately enter into this invisible sanctuary of rest, to trust Him completely for safety without panic or strife. I think that verse, be still and know that I am God, is probably the most important verse in this section. Let's look at that verse just for a few minutes. What does it mean to be still? Well, I've already said one version says, cease striving. Another version, another version said, uh, stand silent, be quiet. So how can we put that verse into practice? Be still. Well, for one thing, we can stop talking. We can switch off our phone. We can turn off the Google machine. We can stop making comments. We can listen. We can stop arguing. We can stop questioning, and we can stop moaning. Be still and know, and know that I am God. Okay, to know. Stop doubting. Be sure. Have faith. Have no second opinion. Know that I am God. Remember. God is almighty. He is in control. God is love. He is king. He is my hope, my rock, and my fortress. He's ever-present. And he's a help in times of trouble. God is my father. God is my shepherd. He will lead me. He'll nourish me. He'll protect me. He'll restore me. Be still and know that I am God. Now, three things I would like you to take with you today from uh, this, uh, this passage. Number one goes back to the very first verse. Do not fear because why? Because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He immediately comes into the situation and helps you. Second thing to remember comes from verse 5. Remember, God was in the midst of Jerusalem. Therefore, if we are Christians, He is within us. And if He is dwelling within us, then we're not going to totter. We're not going to be moved when we get into a troubling situation. And then last of all, in that last section of verses, remember, be still and know that I am God. And that's probably one of the easiest verses to memorize. God says, be still and know that I am God. Cease striving and know that I am God. Stand silent and know that I am God. 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for the fact that you are our refuge and strength. <laughs> that you are a very present help in trouble. And therefore, we have no reason to fear when we get in a troubling situation. As Christians, we know that you dwell within us. And if you're dwelling within us, we know that we should not be moved. We should not totter. We should not fall because you're dwelling within us. Just like the disciples knew that if Jesus was in their boat with them, he was in their midst, the boat would not sink. And last of all, we remember your words, be still and know that I am God. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, and you saved my soul. But you broke them in victory Now I'm free, I am free You're my joy and you are my hope I am saved by your grace alone I will sing of your love for me I am free, I am free You, my God, have saved my soul I am yours for Thank you again for joining us online today. We hope that you have enjoyed this message that Bill shared with us today and hope that it encourages you, inspires you, and causes each one of us to place our trust and our hope in Jesus Christ, knowing that there are times when we just need to be still before Him and to trust Him no matter the circumstances, for He is good and He is faithful to each one of us. 
as you go this day, go not simply out into whatever list and to do things, but go this day as the people of God, as ministers of God, called to the places where you're at, to your home, to your neighborhoods, to your work, to wherever you go. Go as one called by God and sent by God into this world to be the hands and feet of Christ. And so go this day with feet, ready to follow Christ wherever He may lead you, whether that is across the street or around the world. Go with hands open, willing to love, to serve, to touch, to give. For many in this world, you are the only Christ that they will know. And go out of a heart that has been sanctified and made pure by the work of the Holy Spirit. With ears always open to hear the voice of God wherever you may be. With a mouth that continually declares the good news of Jesus Christ to all that you speak to. And with eyes always looking to see where God is at work and where you might join Him in His work of the kingdom. Go this day as the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God to the glory of God. Go, you are sent. You have rescued me from the deepest sea. You have found me. When I couldn't find my way Even when my eyes couldn't find A way in the night You were there Always there My trust is in you My faith is in you You have rescued me You have found me My faith is in you, you have rescued.